Welcome, Austin, Jim, and Al. We're continuing our series here on the the history of war gaming and and Jim's uh, efforts there. And um, what we'd like to talk about today, Jim, is Panzer Blitz. But uh, before we get to Panzer Blitz, Panzer Blitz was preceded by a game called Tactical Game Three, which was one of your test series games. Uh, do you want to explain that a little bit before we dive into Panzer Blitz? Yeah, this is a, this is an idea that myself, Al, uh, Nofi, and um, uh, what do you call uh, Steve Patrick, our lawyer from New Jersey. Uh, came up with. I think John Young had, had some in, input into that as well. And the idea was doing a series of games covering all periods of history, not using the same system, but tactical level games. Uh, Al was an expert on the Renaissance and uh, you know some of those early periods. Uh, Steve and Al were both interested in the Roman, the Greek period. And I figured, well, I can handle the, the modern period. Uh, and one of those early games we published in the magazine, I forget what issue it was, was Tactical Game 3. And that was my first pass at Panzer Blitz. Uh, it impressed people, but it impressed Tom Shaw more than anything else. Now, at this point, I got to reel back a little bit a few years uh, to my relationship with Tom, who's a great guy. Always has been. We always got along well. He was about 10 years older than me, but in those days, that seemed like an eternity. He was the old man. <laughs> anyway... In 65, Avalon Hill published uh, Battle of the Bulge, which was a cool game. But I was doing research on World War II down in Washington at the World War II Records Branch. And I just pulled up the, uh, the data that had not yet been published by the Army. The Army was doing its own series of histories, which I forget when the Bulge came out, but it was li- much later. Those, uh, were, those were the green books, right, yes, Jim? Yes, indeed. Yes. Right. Uh, and they were excellent, excellent works. And um, the, uh, I noticed that the, the order of battle for Bulge was out of whack. And so I wrote a letter to Tom back in the days when you actually wrote a letter and uh, on a typewriter and everything. And um, and I pointed out this and I said, have you guys ever considered you know, sending somebody down to the uh, World War Two records branch? Well, it turned out their two designers at the time uh, uh, were two high school, local high school students. Uh, what, what the hell was the names? Um, uh, Plin- Plinsky. Or, yeah, right. Yeah, Pinsky and, Pinsky uh, and, and and what's his name? The other guy. Yeah, I can't. Work. But anyway, they were both very bright guys. They went on to college and graduate school and et cetera. And I ran into Larry Pinsky later when he came up to visit at SPI. He flew up his own airplane from Texas. And uh, we discussed what was going on back then. That's how I got a lot of my insight into how it worked, you know, before I walked in the door. Well, Tom asked me to uh, uh, stop by. In Baltimore, and I did. And uh, he said, "You know, the anniversary of World War Two is coming. World War One is coming up, and 50th anniversary." And he says, "You know, maybe we should do a game on that." I demurred. I said, "You know, uh, World War One was kind of a downer, but you know, uh, they they've been been very successful with their World War Two games. Uh, they'd already done Africa Corps and uh, U-boat and uh, and uh, and D-Day." Um, and, uh, he said, well, how about Jutland? I said, okay, I'll do Jutland, tactical game. That did very well. I mean, it was, it was unique for Avalon Hill because they'd never done a game using, in effect, cardboard miniatures. Um, and that did very well. So he asked me to do one on the, on the ground battle, 1914. Well, I said, oh man, you know, <laughs> I said, that's easy. There's no motion in that one. He says, the opening stages. Well, I says, yeah, you got some motion, but it stops real quick. I says, okay, I did it. I did it. It was a complicated game. I don't like complicated games. Um, And doing my own production, he expected me to provide all the art. And this man a game board, and what a headache that was. Um, Anyway, it didn't sell as well as uh, as Jutland, and he decided to try another outside designer. Now, I should point out now, when they lost Larry Pinsky and... What's his name? God, his name escapes me. Um, they that was the end of their 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 designers. They had never had full time designers uh, on the staff, 
And apparently he couldn't round up anybody of Pinsky and the other guys, you know, caliber. I think the last games they did were what a squad of canal. That was the one. Yeah, that came after the bulge in 66. Maybe they'd already done it before they had to, you know, go off to college. And um, uh, so I said, well, there's other guys out there. Now, I don't I don't know if I introduced him to Dave Williams. I remember you know, meeting Dave Williams at that time, he came down to visit us at, at SPI, which at that point I think was in a, uh, a third floor loft in on uh, 23rd street. And, um, uh, I encourage, uh, you know, uh, uh, him because, uh, Dave, you know, had a knack for it. As I kept telling people that, you know, uh, if you can play the games with a little extra effort, you can design them. Because any game is really just an amalgam of, of previous game designer mechanics. You might have to invent a few new ones. Uh, and uh, Dave used, uh, I had already done an Italy game for the test series games. And I, I don't know, I guess he had that. Um, and uh, they wanted him to do a game on Anzio. And he did it. It was a very good game. It came out in 69. Now, at that point, uh, I'd started SPI. And this sort of, <laughs> this this sent a message to Tom. He said, oh, my God. You know, we were grinding them out, as it were, and we were doing quite well. And he said, uh, well, how about uh, doing a game for us? Uh, now, instead of, you know, who wanted a, a new game? I said, what about a, a spiffed up version of, of Tactical Game 3, Panzer Blitz? Uh, now, I sweated blood on that one. I mean, I rarely did I have as much trouble getting a game to work as I did with Panzer Blitz. And even as published, there was one glaring exception in, in the rules, which was a problematic called Panzer Bush. In other words, you could hide. There was a trick. I, I tried to eliminate all those. We caught a lot of others, but that one got past this until it was fixed in a later rules revision. Um, but it sold like hockey. I think it ultimately sold over 300,000 copies. Uh, and I made, you know, over, well, I split the royalties with uh, Redmond. I got 60%, he got 40%. And his graphics were, you know, outstanding. Uh, and that really impressed him. And among getting, uh, in addition to getting a slightly higher royalty, and they paid a very small royalty, not like books where you got 10, 15%. It was one tenth of that. Uh, I also got a designer and, and a developer, an artist credit, which was the first. But he was that desperate to get a game. And uh, Eric Dot, who was his boss, the corporate, you know, uh, hedge honcho, um, he went along with that. But I think he also told Tom, I says, Tom, you know, maybe we got to hire some, or I guess Tom came up with this, look, we really need some in-house designers. Because for the next two years, I had a deal with, uh, with Tom. I says, look, I can't design any unique games just for Avalon Hill. But I'll tell you what, games we publish in the magazine, you have dibs on. You know, you can basically buy those. And he bought, um, uh, what do you call it, the uh, uh, France 1940. Uh, oh, I did do one. I did do one other game. Uh, I think it was just for Avalon Hill, Origin to World War Two. I forget if we Avalon, if there was an SPI version of that. I, I think it was. Um, which? To, well, I also did Origin to World War Two. game. No, the origins of World War Two. Oh, origins. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, uh, Avalon Hill had a had a version of that. Um, Wait, no, did, did we publish a version of that? I, oh I no, no, I don't. We, we okay, we just did it for that. And I did one more game for them. Now he got France forty, and that was working for him. Um, and then I said, he said, "Look, I says, can you do a game? You know, what can't you do a game on?" I said, "I can do a game on anything." So he made a bet. Now, this, this was one of those serendipitous things. He said, all right, how about getting lost in the woods? I said, no problem. When do you want it? And that became Outdoor Survival. Now, the kicker in Outdoor Survival was he would pay me a higher royalty if it outsold a game he had done. I think he had done it called Kriegspiel, which is another, it was just an abstract, you know, tactical game. That came out the same year as, as Panzer Blitz and, and didn't sell nearly as well, but he figured it would sell uh, better than a game on getting lost in the woods or surviving being lost in the woods. <laughs> uh, it didn't from the, from right at the gate, outdoor survival did much better. Now that outdoor survival kept selling more and more and more into the seventies. Eventually I found out why when Dungeons and Dragons came along, outdoor survival was the ideal game for a, a strategic level D and D to uh, set up their scenarios. 
yeah. and that people would buy that and they would modify it. And, you know, this is, it, it, this is, you know, some part of, you know, the, uh, uh, the Lord of the Rings that universe where they could, they could break whatever laws they wanted because they owned the game and they weren't publishing it, but they used it to generate their, their tactical scenarios. So it basically got a, a you know, a, got its wind and never really lost it. Um, but after that, uh, they decided to. Uh, I got. A, I think I got a call from Tom. I guess in late '71, and he says, "You know, we're thinking of hiring somebody to uh, edit the General. That's their magazine, and help out with the uh, full-time guy and help out with the design." So I recommended uh, Don Greenwood, whom I knew uh, knew as a very avid wargamer who was publishing one of the many zines. I forget which one he was publishing. Uh, but these would sell, you know, a few hundred thousand or so copies, which is a big deal. You can make money on that. Not a lot. Um, and, uh, I remember he stopped by in seven, well, actually he stopped by in 71 or 70 late. Yeah. He stopped by in New York because I remember I saw him in the, uh, that old three story loft, which we were only for about a year before we moved over to down the block to, uh, uh, 23rd and park Avenue South. And we were there for like about eight years. We were on the third floor. Then we moved up to the seventh floor or something like that. And, um, the, uh, uh, he took the job and he did very well. Tom was pleased with that. And then I think it was Don who brought in Randy Reed. I didn't know Randy. I knew of him, but I didn't know him like I knew uh, Don and Randy turned out to be very good. And so that, that was their, their two man in-house design team. Now, eventually they did solicit outside games and they started like Jedco, an Australian company, which was doing some great stuff. Uh, they, they basically bought a, a number of their games, uh, John Prados, uh, you know, there's, they collected, you know, a, uh, a outside uh, designers and, uh, uh, and they saw bigger numbers than SPI. So that was an attraction. Although we got a lot of them anyway, uh, you know, the outside designers, um, and, uh, that basically, you know, they didn't need SPI anymore. They were designing enough for their own. In fact, I think by 74, that was the year they published eight games. They designed and got out eight games. That was just, you know, Randy and then Don, uh, plus whatever, you know, freelancers they, they picked up in, in, in Baltimore. And, um, uh, that was the, that was basically the end of it. You know, he got my games. Apparently he later told me that, that Eric Dot was kind of a little scared of us because we could turn out these games so quickly. And, and the outdoor survival really spooked him. <laughs> and because you just told him he, he could do a game on anyone and you said getting lost in the woods and it became a bestseller. I says, Jesus. Um, they never offered me a job, but anyway, well, how could you possibly? I was running their, their main competitor. Uh, by 74, 75, we were the uh you know the, the biggest producer of board games uh and dollar wise i think we were getting close to avalon hill which is still selling exclusively through the retail channel uh box you know games and they were still publishing a lot of non-war games but the war games are really had become their bread and butter um so that's basically what happened with avalon hill in the meantime i was also encouraging other designers out there to start your own we wrote a book uh, when did that come out war game design that was '76. Yeah, it was. Ugh. It was in that period. Yeah, but even in, in that, fact, I, I, just I as a, a an aside, the first time I was exposed to you was through that book because I I was an avid reader and I had I said there has to be a book on design out there and I had a librarian that I lived in a really small community but she knew how to use the inner loan. Uh, yes. system yes. and she got yes. that in hardcover for yeah, me to I, read I, and so there's a little was... tiny school uh school library up in uh in idaho that has that book in hardcover <laughs> well <Very good. laughs> the origins of that book came from when we were publishing all this stuff in the s and t like we had this column at going mail which i wrote you know every two months mm. and uh and i designed a, i i basically discussed in make some issues, uh, the game business. You know, we published our numbers. I discussed the mechanics of you know getting you know the artwork and what have you. And this basically inspired guys like the Game Designers Workshop out in where were they, Illinois, um, and several other you know companies. A couple in New York City, uh, and some in California. I mean, they were popping up all over the place, uh, and they were making money. At least they were breaking even. Because we would let them advertise in, in S&T. You couldn't advertise in the general. The general never took a, a, ads from the competition. 
Um, and the only reason we got started was because there was one rival wargaming magazine, a strategy and tactics published out of, uh, out of Japan and, and later in New Jersey, which was not making money. Uh, and we basically bought that for a buck and then added a game to it, spiffed up the art, Redmond spiffed up the design of it. In fact, he had contributed to it. He, I think he might've been one who put me onto it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, uh, I think the yeah the first edition of S&T came out in, in the end of '69, um, and uh, that basically you know, revolutionized not just the paper game business, but it basically set the model for games in general to this very day. Because when the computers came along, and I at the end of the '70s, I was giving in one of my lectures. I go to the Origins of the Convention, and I give God knows you know a dozen or more talks. You know, it was just done again. You're rambling on. And uh, one of them was Napoleon at IBM. Now, we already had, you know, a mini, uh, we had a mini computer in the early 70s. We got microcomputers about six, seven years later. And we were using them for business. And, you know, we wrote programs for help with game design and what have you. And I realized, and I followed the industry. I got the, you know, the, the computer industry magazines. There were, you know, the tech ones, not, not just the, the consumer ones. And they were already talking about the ad- coming advances in, uh, in, in, in uh, not just processing power, which was not a big deal for a strategic, I, I, they're putting a manual game on a computer, but for graphics. In other words, once you could put the game board on the screen, and you could do that by the early 80s. Uh, you know, in, in glorious color and fairly high resolution. Well, you know, 800 by 600, whatever. But anyway, compared to today, that's crude. But back then, it was it was amazing. Um, I said, this is going to be the future. In fact, when I left in 80, we were do- doing our first war game. We were computerizing a game I did, the uh, uh, the Loss of the Pandora, a space, you know, a science fiction mm-hmm. game. That actually, I, that actually right. got done in, in for Apple because, again, Apple was the only um, computer... Uh, that had you know decent graphics compared to the IBM for the Radio Shack and what have you. Uh, the IBM had just come out in eighty one, I think eighty two, the personal computer, uh, but none of them really had much in the way of graphics because uh, Apple came out in eighty four with the Macintosh, and that had that had the graphics of the future, a tiny screen, but still. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think the Pandora, you know, I, I left in 80 and, and SPI went belly up in 83, I guess it was. Yeah, I, I had the, I had the, uh, uh, I guess it would have been the, it was a prototype copy. Beta copy. Yeah. Yeah, I had, no, I had a copy. No, it wasn't even too. beta. It was like, you, you know, you could move the characters back and forth. But there was no combat or anything yet going on. It was. Oh, you know, I forget the version I had. I thought was fairly complete. I lent uh, it to somebody who never got it back, which just goes to show you. But anyway, the uh, I had to borrow an Apple to play it. I eventually started getting Apples for business reasons. That's another story. I went through several of those, uh, but. Uh, but Apple always impressed me because they were one step ahead and several steps ahead in price, but one step ahead in, in technology. Uh, and for a while, that's where all the gamers were going. But then they realized that it was the PCs, the the, uh, the IBM t- standard PC, uh, that was uh, generating the huge numbers and started, started to see more and more games. Now, that didn't destroy the uh, paper games business, but it basically over, overtook it. And throughout the 80s and into the early 90s, I'd be bumping into uh, guys working, you know, for uh, very, you know, the various computer uh, game companies uh, who had been fans of SPI in the early days. Uh, that generation has since passed on, and now there's a generation SPI. What's that? But anyway, right. uh, <laughs> the, pi- the pioneers in the computer. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, 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 you know, the uh, boys out in uh, Utah were designing war games as well. Um, and uh, the uh, they recognized, you know, the, the all some of them had heard the Napoleon at IBM, you know, lecture, which basically described a uh, a war game using high resolution graphics, which weren't going to be available for another, you know, until the early 80s, um, uh, late 80s, really. And uh, but that's all she wrote after that. Now, the uh, you still have people publishing. Uh, Manual games. In fact, S and T is still being published out in California, and and the key guy there is Joe Miranda, who I think has just surpassed my record for number of games designed and published. Yeah, I think he's. I think he's pretty darn close, or he's gone past it. Uh, yeah, 
He, yeah, I'm pretty sure he's best, but he's still grinding him out, you know. Yeah, because he's been doing it for two decades, and you only did yeah. it for one. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and he did he did most of the games for S S, S and T after uh, after I guess yeah. in the after the nineties, well late eighties, early nineties. Right. And he wouldn't do them all, but he'd do most of them. So he was back he was knocking out twenty or thirty a, a year. Yeah. So it didn't it wasn't long before he'd catch up. Anyway. The, so there's still a market for them, although I think the circulation of S&T now, with, well, I think it publishes a, a with game or without game version, what I have you. But it was uh, last time I checked about 10 years ago, it was only about, you know, 5,000. Yeah, they uh, they actually went to an interesting model where they've actually got three magazines now. They've got the, the old S&T and they do something called Modern War where they only right. focus on modern stuff. And then they yeah. do a World War II one. <laughs> Um, yeah, and, and they, but they still publish games, but I think they're semi-detached. You can well, order both, the magazine right. And a game, but right. Mostly, it, it's it's one or the what well, you can order one or the other. Yeah, their strategy was is they'll put the I I think it's to track new blood by they put the magazine only one in Barnes and Nobles and other places that have magazine racks, and yeah, so no, you know. <laughs> And and so yeah. then you pick it up, and then there's a way to order the game if uh, you would like to try out the game. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. yeah S and T always always uh, basically had that approach. We had two main articles in there. One was basically on the subject of the game in the magazine. So they probably saw the the, the, the wisdom of saying, well, you know, we don't have to put the game in there. We just do the article. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think and, that's and, what they and, saw. And, ex- and explain what can happen if you turn this into a game. Yeah, they smart guys out there. Yeah. Uh, it's run by a retired Army doctor. Uh, Chris Cummings. Chris Cummings. Chris, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. And uh, he's getting on in years. But anyway, uh, <laughs> he was a war gamer like a lot of guys in the Army were. Uh, and they picked up on this. Now, it's still a lot cheaper. If you want to get into the war games publishing business, it's a lot cheaper to do it with manual games, uh, you know, uh, paper games, than it is with the computer games. Although some people are. There are tools available now. Uh, I'm not talking about the, uh, you know, the, the engines, the game engines you can buy. And there's really only one game engine, which I think changed their rules. So if you sell less than a million dollars worth of your game, you don't have to pay royalties. Mm-hmm. Let's see, what's the name of the engine? Uh, well, there's there's a couple of 3D engines out there, and then there's um, the one that you can do both 2D and 3D in, which is Unity, I think is the name of it. Yeah, I forget, I forget the name, but they, they were the big deal. I remember in the 90s when I was doing a job for the Air Force, they and they wanted a game, uh, well, I forget, well, it was an intelligence game or something like that. But anyway. Yeah, but Jim, uh, but Jim, you and I worked on that at the uh, Air Intelligence School down in uh, right. San Antonio. San Antonio, and it yeah, was a, yeah. It was a sensor warfare game. That's, right, that's right, right. That was it. That was it. That was it. Yeah. And actually, and you, it actually turned out to be very popular with people in the Air Force. Actually, it did. Out. But it, it, it basically was, it was abandoned. Because a new colonel would come in in charge of the, you know, the training age, whatever compartment. He said, well, I don't like yeah. this. And that yeah. was always a problem. And I remember once right. they invited me down to the War College, they had published, they had not published a game, but they had created a game, the McClinic Theater Model, which is based on the, the, one of the NATO Warsaw Pact games we did. And... Um, and the guy who basically programmed it was Fred McClinic. So they called it the McClinic Theater Model. It was a very good game. But as I pointed out, they had a, a users, uh, a global users, uh, you know, a, a meeting, as it were, a conference. Mm-hmm. And they had me to talk. And I says, look, I says, these games, the good ones are living things. You've got to keep updating them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not just talking about the design, but the software, because new computers come along, more powerful computers, and you have to take advantage of it. Now, the problem that ran into was the army is a bureaucracy, and it's such a hassle you know, to get money for mm-hmm. you know, converting something yeah. to a new something. They, they've always had a problem with that. The government, non-Department of Defense, is even worse. They're still running stuff that, that was uh, if COBOL programs... <laughs> when the IBM 360 was the main iron, you know, you designed for. But that's another problem. With the, um, but with, uh, with the, uh, with Python and ba- and the other languages available today and, 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 the, and the developer kits, yeah. uh, there's a lot more of that. Anybody who's, who's got, you know, some chops as a, as a programmer and is a war gamer, they can design their own and publish it on the web. And of course, Steam, I don't know if Steam exists. Yeah, Steam. The, the, Steam is uh, doing some good things where they're letting indies come in and right. and do some stuff. 
but it still doesn't have the the computer games don't have the organization the ecosystem that the the published games on paper do uh you know board you've got board game geek that is out there you've got a bunch of people doing uh different online sites you've got con con sim world that is uh an area for the groganards together you've still got groganards Dot com. Yeah. And so you've got a lot more action going on and more intellectual uh, discussion of the games than you, you get with the computer games. And that's, you know, what you've always talked about is because somebody can come in there and tear the rules apart and look at it. And, and the computer Modify. games are obtuse uh, and uh, not obtuse, but opaque in the the ability to get to the rules and understand exactly what the rules are doing and how they were. Well, well, Ex the, Machina is the problem on that. The gods and the machine and you can't well, see the yeah. actually, actually, a lot of game developers recognize that problem. It wasn't just war games, but, you know, computer games in general. And a lot of the more strategic games, I guess Civilization, which is still kicking after, what, 20 or 25 Yeah, years? they're on version oh, 6 now. Jesus. But anyway, they, um, they from the beginning had a, uh, a lot of uh, customization, you know, user customization tools. You could make right. your own maps, you could, you could modify a yeah. lot of the rules, uh, and, and I think there's even an option I, in some of the versions, probably the later ones, where you can even turn on it telling you what the odds are and blah, blah, blah. In other words, goes yeah. through all the things you normally you know, have to face in person on a, yeah. on a manual game. Well, and uh, it, you know what? That's because... You know, I met Sid once, the the designer of, and he's an old war gamer. And yes, in fact, <laughs> Avalon who published Advanced Civilization, the, the right. war game version. Yeah. So, I I want to rewind though, Jim, back to Panzer Blitz, ah. because <laughs> there there were a number of things that you did there that were unique and basically first. So, First of all, uh, before you guys did started doing the test series games, there hadn't been anything done that tactical, right? Right. That was what made it so yeah. difficult, and that's one reason why you know the the, the 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 gang of three or four, you know, including me and Al, uh, got came up with the idea for the uh, the tactical series games. In fact, we published the whole melange of them, the six or seven or eight of them, whatever it was. But by the uh, way, just bad. just out of interest, those those tactical games on eBay uh, go for in the seven to eight hundred dollar range. God, I knew I should have, you know, yeah. kept some. And I had one at one time. <laughs> I think it was test three and I was playing it as a, a freshman at Rice is when we with one of my um uh, yeah, they they. I don't have it. Any, I haven't seen it. Probably yeah. In three other ones, you know, your other S and T's will get up in the hundred dollar range. Like uh, yeah. Chicago, Chicago goes for oh, about yeah. one fifty, <laughs> which we'll have to talk about at another time. But I want to get back to Panzer Blitz. So, the other thing was the module modular map. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was new, well, right? That, that was that was necessary because the idea behind that game was there are many different scenarios in the Eastern Front, and to give the game variety, we, I, that was always a problem with games. If you had the same map, that was a fixed element, and it was easier for gamers to to basically you know break the game, you know figure out a way to mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to not cheat, but basically come up with a tactic which took advantage of the game mechanics to make it too easy for one side or the other to to win. So we were always aware of that. And that, and since Avalon Hill was paying for all this production, I said, well, why not just boards? You know, individual boards just stick together. Uh, because they had mounted boards and everything. And that was He called it ge geomorphic? Right. Yeah, right. and that they, name they, has they, stuck. They would all fit together no matter how you arrange them. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, here's something that most people aren't aware of unless they speak Russian. Uh, all the names on the board were in, Eng in English alphabet, but they were in Russian. And yeah. what I did was, it's one, you know... Nobody realized there was this is big done with a sense of humor, as it were, as much as one can, you know, humorize the Soviet uh, Union. Um, the uh, 
uh, the State Farm on one of the boards was called State Farm 69. So that was a little like my 60s humor. Uh, but all the names, one name I remember, I forget all the names, but the one that always stuck with me was Bednost, which means hunger. And that was the name of one of the villages. But they were all named like that. And <laughs> since very few people spoke Russian, uh, or that they did they say this must be a you know some sort of you know accident, um, but you know it was it was true to the uh, true to the uh, the period because I later found out when the Soviet Union fell apart their archives were opened up and they actually published the uh, that casualty data from World War Two well, actually for the 20th century up to World War Two, uh, yeah. but the main thing that everybody was looking at was World War Two. Uh, Twenty nine million people died. Mm -hmm. uh, most of them were, were, were from non-combat causes and most of those were civilians. So basically most of the dead were civilians because every time the, the Germans rolled through a village, burned it, you know, uh, looted it and what have you, drove the civilians away. And winter came. A lot of those people would die from starvation, mm -hmm. uh, exposure and what have you. Uh, and that's something even the Russians tried to cover up because basically during the uh, the war they lost 18 percent of the population, men, women, and children. But it was mainly you know a lot a lot of them were women and children. Uh, but even in areas Russia controlled, there was never enough food, not just Leningrad, but you know everywhere. But basically they they basically uh, their, their their tactic, which was militarily sound, was to concentrate all resources you know to the the point of main main effort. Uh, and that meant secondary fronts were on short rations <laughs> until they could capture enough food, uh, you know, when the when in areas they, they chased the Germans out of, you know, to get farming going again, what have you. In fact, it was the American, God knows how many millions of Russians, the American led least because we sent them a lot of food. You know, uh, spam was very popular. Um, and, uh, you know, well, we sent them wheat and what have you. That was mainly through uh, uh, the northern ports, uh, at the Pacific ports, where the Japanese and, and Russians had a had a truce. So the Russian ships would come into America, load up on all sorts of supplies, uh, take them into uh, Vladivostok, put them on the you know the, uh, the Trans Siberian Railroad, uh, which was worked real hard, and uh, you know basically kept a lot of Russians alive because they simply didn't have the food to keep everybody fed. Um, but anyway, we were aware of factors like that. I mean, uh, our games were notable for taking account in, into account of logistics. Now, some of the Avalon Hill games did as well, but not as much as us. I mean, we didn't go crazy with that. I said, look, you got to have logistics, but it's got to be playable. Uh, yeah, I so think it's always, Don Greenwood has a phrase that says, nobody wants to play quartermaster general. Exactly. <laughs> but without it, you know, you're, you're very yeah. unrealistic. And I think I think the North African uh, games were, were famous for that, even the Avalon <laughs> Hill ones, because really what was critical was control of the Mediterranean. Uh, you know, the RAF held on to Malta because it basically prevented the, uh, you know, the Italians and the Germans from having a free ride, you know, from, from you know, uh, the boot of, from Italy uh, straight across to Tunisia, which the Italians had turned into a colony. Um, uh, so it was really the, the tactical. And when the United States entered the war in late 41, by 42, we were sending enough planes and tanks and what have you, especially aircraft. Uh, you know, we basically uh, uh, enabled the British to uh, basically hold on in Malta, which is basically under under a constant attack for several mm -hmm. years uh, before we uh, the Mon Montgomery and Patton finally took Sicily and, and forced the Italians out of the war. Uh, but yes, and there were many games where logistics was absolutely important. So uh, let's talk a little bit about. Uh I don't know if there were – I was trying to get a copy of this so I could look at it before we we talked, but uh, Panzer Group Guderian had some interesting features to it. And this was one that uh, Avalon Hill picked up was yes, that the they, 80s, they – 83, they, 84, they bought it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, now, the thing with uh, Panzer Group Guderian was that was the uh, example of what the Germans were up against – in their rush to take Moscow. Now, Smolensk was in Bet what is now Belarusia, uh, and it was a key staging area for the final jump, you know, to Moscow, which the Germans only got sight of, you know, at the towers of Moscow, and then they had the retreat. Um, but the problem was you had to keep your lines of communication, or the, the, ro the roads, they were, the Germans were built, rebuilding the railroads as quickly as they could, but basically, the last... Hundred, you know, a couple hundred or so kilometers, uh, you know, had to be uh, handled by truck or even horse drawn. You know, one thing, another, another thing, most people don't realize in World War II that the German army 
uh, basically moved by horse. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think who was it that, that one of our chums, uh, the Hippo Train? Uh, Rich, Rich Denardo. Rich Denardo, right. Yes, he right. did uh, that. And, uh, the place. The, um, For, uh, when he was at the, uh, where was he at the Navy? He was, he, he no, was he, in graduate school when he did that. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, that was his doctoral uh, dissertation. I, I helped uh, Jim. I helped him do some of the translation from the uh, from the material he found. I think it was in a library in Freiburg, Germany, back yeah. on, on. It was fa- fascinating. It was re- German remount problems in uh, yeah. World right. War. II. Yeah, it was yeah. amazing how much horse flesh they had to use. Absolutely, absolutely. The uh, well, the, 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 the one advantage to that was when your when your when your transportation died, you could eat it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the trucks were much more efficient as long as you had the trucks and, and, the, and the wheels. And, and the Americans were uh, uh, amazed when they got into Europe uh, in, uh, in 1944 as they were overrunning, you know, German divisions that a lot of these divisions had like uh, captured trucks and vehicles of a, over a dozen different models from different countries. Yeah. And it must have been a logistics, you know, maintenance nightmare. Oh. Uh, yeah. And indeed it was, and that's one reason why they were very fragile, even though they, many of their units were motorized and a lot of their, their strategic transportation. And that's why, they, they, in fact, the, any battle of the bulge game is, has to rely on logistics, because that's what really limited the German advance. Uh, they expected to uh, overrun Allied supply dumps, which <laughs> uh, there's the famous story of the, of the, of the petroleum dump uh, 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 the Americans were, uh, were guarding. And they never did capture that. And in fact, it was on a hill, and the Americans rolled down the barrels of, uh, of gasoline and what have you, petrol, and lit it a fire. And the Germans said, "Well, screw this. We'll have to just limp along. Uh, these bastards are not going to give it up." Uh, but the, uh, the the Germans were in very bad shape. And in fact, the Battle of Bulge was only possible because they they basically issued all the orders by by letter. By they had to be hand hand delivered as where they didn't use radio. They they were kind of they hadn't figured out the ultra system uh, yet. The the code breaking, but they said mm, we got to guarantee security, uh, and they did. And it was a surprise, but it was a short lived surprise because those Germans they had one or two loads of fuel for their tanks. Uh, and after that was gone, uh, so was the offensive. And then right. they didn't expect Patton to turn around and, and hit him in the flank as, as soon as he did. Uh, but anyway, the even on the eastern front, it was the same thing. The Russians were getting all this petroleum, well, from their own oil fields in the uh, on the Caspian, what is now Azerbaijan. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, some kinds of fuel they had to get from the United States. For example, aviation fuel. Their, their refineries just couldn't make the high-quality stuff. That made their aircraft uh, perform best. And after the war, uh, I guess it was after the Soviet Union fell, we could ask some of the old timers, what, what were the most important things logistically you got from the United States? And they said, well, it was uh, high octane fuel, uh, waterproof communications wire, mm-hmm. but they couldn't make that you know, as well as they needed. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think tactical radios, because mm-hmm. throughout the war, most of their tanks didn't have radio. You know, the company commander had a radio, and otherwise it was hand signals. Uh, and, uh, and, and so the, the, uh, the Russians got around that. Uh, and by the end of the war, I think all their, vehic- uh, their, their tanks, or at least, you know, the one in four, every platoon, you know, uh, you know had, the leader had a radio, and it was much easier to communicate. So there were a lot of shortcomings that you had to take into account. And that was the thing that people liked about the manual games, because we did that article you know, in S&T, where we put it out a lot of those things. And right. Basically, in doing the game, we had to do our research. And that's where I got the phrase, you know, the game will talk back to you after all. Well, once you get it working, mm-hmm. it will tell me I need this. I right. Need that. There's and, something missing. And one of the things you figured out in that game was, hey, these Russian troops, nobody really knew what their capabilities oh. were and what their the strengths Russians were. Did. And you <laughs> hid that, right? Yeah. yeah, and you know the funny thing is, I came up with that idea, and I said, you know, that sounds familiar. Didn't somebody else do it? And somebody said, yeah, you did it in the Franco-Prussian War games. Ah, well, still. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, but anyway, the um, uh, you know, so you can reinvent your own wheel. But anyway, yeah, we had all the Russian counters in the beginning uh, were two-sided, and on one side it just said infantry, you know, tank, whatever. But on the other side, we had an accurate distribution 
of the German units that were low quality and high quality. You mean the Russian the, units, the right? Russian Russian, units, sorry, yeah. the Russian units, right? The Russian units. And the point was, even the Russians didn't know which, which units they were, they were best because Stalin had killed all the known competent officers and they were basically promoting, you know, a battalion and, and what have you, commanders to, to command divisions. Uh, uh, and it really, in, in that phase of the war, it took a really magnetic, energetic commander to get the unit together. It wasn't just a matter of making the right decisions on the battlefield, but it was motivating the troops, carrying out training, seeing to the supplies, you know, yeah. borrowing and stealing, you know, enough food, enough fuel, enough ammunition, so his guys could fight. A lot of generals wouldn't do that. They'd say, hey, I, 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 I issued an order to the, you know, to the supply secretariat, and they didn't deliver. Well, you know, a good commander will say, well, screw that. I mean, uh, Patton was infamous for that, you know, for that. You know, he was a thief. Uh, and all good commanders are thieves. And he'd, he'd roll into an area, and it wasn't just the civilians had to worry about Patton's, you know, procurement NCOs, uh, but it was, you know, other allied, other American and allied units. Um, the Marines were like that. The army yeah. said, these Marines, you know, they're thieves. Well, that's why they're so, so successful. They don't run out of ammo. You might, but they don't. Uh, so that had to be represented in the game, but in a way that neither side knew... <laughs> Which units were good, and that was the brilliance of it. Exactly. I mean, it basically solved a key problem in the campaign, and and that's one reason why the game had legs. It had replayability mm-hmm. because you know, no matter how good you came with certain tactics, if you had a bad run of luck, and it, it, the German, it, the Russians had somehow deployed, you know, their seven best, you know, uh, divisions, uh, uh, you know, without even knowing it, in your in the path of your main thrust, boom, you were stuck. All right, I'm going to speak to that. I was playing the Germans one time against a friend of mine in Panzer Group Guderian, launched a main attack and ran right in to one of those guards, heavy guards units. It's, yeah. uh, it destroys your expectations, I should say. <laughs> it destroys, destroys your momentum as well. Absolutely. As your- yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's actually one that's on my list to pick up because I, I want to experience that. Because so, yeah. it... it I don't- but that's something the, the Army admired. Uh, they looked at our games and they said, oh, they caught this, they caught that. Because the, the professionals say, you know, that the amateurs study tactics, professionals study logistics, or the unknown, the unknown, the, the intelligence right. factors. And they were always surprised at how we could incorporate that in a playable game. They had games, some of them were computerized games, that nobody understood what the hell was going on. And that's one thing I hammered into Fred McClinic, who had... But who would, I don't know if he was consider what we consider a grog, not a war gamer, but he was familiar with the manual games. He could play them, he could read them, understand the rules, and what have you. I says, I says, Fred, you got to make the game accessible. You know, the players have to be able to have. In fact, in one game I did for uh, Ray Macedoni after he retired, he was doing a uh, a game for uh, uh, you know again sensor fused munitions. Uh, that was the big thing Jim, back in the eighties. It, it was for Textron when he right. retired and become vice president. He was chief Textron. scientist for uh, Textron, and they had these sensor fused munitions, which eventually got done. But one thing they needed was a tactical game, which showed how how effective or ineffective they would be. And so I got a guy with a uh, with a workstation. I forget. It, it, I calculated it had the power of a 486. That's the pre. Uh, well, anyway, it's it's an ancient, but it was the most powerful in the mid 80s. And it, it had this in this in this uh, in this Macintosh, you know, like with a with a very expensive uh, uh, but very detailed visual display. And I guess I forget the name of the. It was a, it was a language written for building simulations. And he had this guy doing it. And I said, Simula. No, no, it wasn't Simula. Okay. No, but anyway, um, the uh, I've written it in an article somewhere. So you dig through my bibliography, you'll find it. But anyway, the uh, thing I insisted he put in there is just look. I says normally we use you know even then the F1 key was becoming you know the key for if you wanted help. I says make the F1 key the truth key. In other words, wherever you whenever you're doing in a game, and of course this became standard. You know, not with a key key you hit, but you could basically right click or something like that and up would pop up some explanation in some games and it would basically show the user how this calculation was made and I call it you could drill down now this he gave me a funny look I says no really it's important because the game 
Well, it was going to be used by some, you know, uh, some of uh, Ray Macedonia's, you know, key associates who understood, you know, what was going on here. It would all it was also going to be used by some people who did not, who were not really gamers. I mean, they could they could play a computer game, uh, but as Austin pointed out, they were basically turned off by the black box program. I just well, well, okay. let, uh, let me interject something box. here, Jim, on that. You and I occasionally, uh, 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 singularly, instead of double on it would go up to uh, Boston and I recall spending three days with Macedonia's team where they had actually put this into a fairly especially for 1986 super super graphics on this they took all, took all yeah, that it's, work it's a great little game yeah no it was it was it ultimately led Dan to uh, Textron developing a weapon system called Wide Area Munition. Wow. Mm. It's finally yep. fielded as a Hornet, which was a shoot this up in the air. It'd be triggered by either uh, acoustic, uh, seismic, uh, uh, or potentially a timer, but it was acoustic and, and, and seismic uh, sensors systems. Fire it up in the air, and then it has a heat seeking. It would be gummed down trying to find the, the engine of a Russian tank is what the idea Right. Was. Yeah. And what what they wanted in the game was and, and Ray knew I could do this, as is you've got to put in the, the basically the the psychology of, of the Russian army, which I was well versed in. And so we had that, we had variability because I said, look, technically on paper, uh, these munitions could be compromised by just having advancing infantry units who would get out and find it because basically they're left there in the field. Infantry could sneak up on them. A vehicle would set them off. But the infantry could get in there and just boom, 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 you know, wreck them with a few uh, AK-47 rounds. Uh, but I says, not all Russian units are going to uh, deploy like this. The Russians don't have NCOs. I mean, if you had a, you know, a sergeant major, first sergeants who get in there, you know, uh, you guys do this, do that. No, it had to be junior officers. Can you imagine running an army without NCOs? That's what the, Germ- the Russians were doing, uh, you know, throughout the Cold War. So these troops would be rolling up, boom, you know, a couple of their vehicles would get hit by these uh, wide area munitions. They'd recognize it. They might not. If not, they'd panic. Uh, but, you know, we, we had to assume the, the word to get back that they, if you encounter this, this is what you do. And it would be up to these lieutenants uh, to, to, uh, to basically stop the men from panicking, to get them to deploy, you know, look for it and what have you. The Russians didn't train their men like that. And, I, and, 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 and Ray had appreciated that. Anybody who knew anything about the, uh, you know, the Red Army at that time realized this. It was their great weakness. Uh, and... Um, the, there was uh, there, there was also something that, that that it did. It forced the Russians to move down to, to uh, two and a half miles an hour walking instead right. of trying to run exactly. that run that uh, fifteen twenty mile an hour heavy uh, armor mm-hmm. uh, attack in ma- and mass. And and Jim, when we put together those geomorphic maps on this, yeah, modeled some of it after the Mangan Gap area and part of it up at the northern part of, Fo- of the Fold Gap. I was in the 11th Cav for about a year in the Mangan Gap. So it, it, it was terrain accurate for one of the major fast avenues of approach, and it substantially slowed them down. You know what? That's a big gain for the good guys. Yeah, I can remember, I can remember reading about this system and, and what a game changer it could be for the U.S., well, not only that, we tested one of the scenarios we tested. And one thing we could do with this game was you could, you could Monte Carlo it. In other words, you could run it over the weekend or overnight, what mm, I mean, and do yeah. it basically, basically play itself. But one of the things we had, what happens if the Russians decide just to pull through? Because they've been known to do that. Uh, and one of the problems somebody pointed out, I don't know if it was me or some one of their Soviet experts, is just, these are elite units. Following them are non-elite units, mm-hmm. and they really had, and, they, and so they might, some general might decide to sacrifice a couple of his regiments, you know, to to bull his way through. But the and and but the white area munitions took that into account because you could rapidly deploy more of them. Uh, and so we concluded from those uh, from those tests uh, that if the Russians did that. They would take what we call unacceptable losses. But Austin is basically right. No matter what they did, they were going to be slowed down. It, look, and the other thing is, is you, it's not fighting the war. This, these little robots, and that's the, the way Ray uh, uh, talked uh, 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 talked about it. I, I, I know from a conversation he, he and I had in 1982 about alternative uh, defenses 
uh, in, 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 in West Germany, is that it's not out there fighting by itself. We've got Air Force, our own right. mechanized forces, and you've in some of these places, when they're moving through, would be those German, what they call them, um, Heimatschutz, uh, yes. Einheits, uh, home, home defense uh, platoons, you know, old, older reservists out there, the forest meister and the like. And these guys are in there uh, monitoring it as well. So it, what it did was uh, slow a, a Soviet really attack from garrison down mm. immensely. If you, and that was one of mm. our, our big fears. It was a, gr- a fantastic game to try it's, to, to and deal with. What the, what the white air munitions did, never underestimate the um, importance of psychology. The Russians were always afraid of American technology. They still are. Uh, although now they're afraid of Chinese technology. But anyway, <laughs> the, um, they saw that. Uh, they probably even heard about the, uh, you know, the tactical model, you know, I did for Textron. Uh, and they're an analyst, uh, one, one of whom, I guess this was in the eighties. He was asked to do a, uh, a, a, basically a, a run through. They had their, um, their war game, which was, were fairly good. Their manual game, uh, uh, correlation of forces and what have you. And he concluded that, uh, the, the red army could no longer expect to, uh, make a run for the Rhine, uh, because the American technology, plus we changed our tactics. We become offensive. In other words, we weren't just going to defend. We were also uh, training to. Uh, that was air, was that an airland battle? Uh, we were basically training to uh, hit them in the flank, what have you, uh, and that just it scared the bejesus out of the Germans because that's what the Germans would always do to them during World War II. Uh, and, and indeed, we were taking advice from uh, World War Vermont generals. In fact, we had there was that conference in 1980. Uh, that I got hauled in on where they had these two Vermont generals um, and uh, and a whole bunch of army American army generals in the audience. And uh, they basically explained how they would take advantage of the, uh, the Russian uh, uh, inflexibility. Uh, the, the classic example he gave was a Russian b- tank brigade was rolling down uh, past a, uh, a German tank company that was in a flood. In other words, it was hidden. And they saw this German brigade, you know, 30 or 40, you know, tanks rolling by. And they decided, well, let's just get behind them. And they destroyed almost all of them from the rear. And because they, their absence of radios and who was looking towards the rear, you know, in the Red Army, you look forward. You know, by the time the guy at the front turned around, he had no more people following him, just burning wrecks. Uh, so so one, of, one, of, one of those German generals was von Balk, as I recall. Right. And the other I, read, was I read the transcripts of that in, in uh, entire whatever. At least, at least two of the panels. I think they they had on it. That fellow was regarded uh, uh, by the Germans as one of their best defensive uh, uh, generals. <laughs> the, we look. The U.S. Army uh, in 1975 was training for what was called "stay behind" too. Yeah. Especially if we've got beaten back in a cover, covering force, our job was to try to, guess what, go into East Germany and turn around and shoot up some of these secondary forces if we're mm-hmm. still on the map, so to speak. Right. Well, one, of, one of the the problems the Russians had in the Second World War, it's not just that Stalin shot all the, the, the able officers. He was shooting able people all over the country. So unlike the U.S., where you know you could get you could get a high school principal and and you know t- turn him into a, a infantry lieutenant colonel, they didn't have those people because uh, our factory managers and stuff like that were being shot just you know along with everybody else. And be- the level of education of the average Russian wasn't that great, um, even under you know even though they supposedly were opening schools all over the country. A guy with a high school diploma would frequently end up as a lieutenant, which you know, which gives you some idea of, of you know, how, mu- how much initiative is this guy going to have uh, on a battlefield? Yeah, towards the end, they basically developed a, a wartime army, which was not yeah. allowed to exist in peacetime. Yeah. And after the war was over, they reorganized. They sent a lot of these uh, uh, officers with initiative to the Gulag. Uh, and it was back to business as usual. And that's one reason why the, uh, you know, when Stalin died, they basically got rid of Stalinism <laughs> because the survivors of Stalinism realized this cannot go on. 
Uh, they try to keep it secret. That was the secret speech Khrushchev made. Um, and that really changed everything. But anyway, that was that was that's ancient history. But it will repeat itself. Right. So what happening in uh, in Iran, in Iraq, well throughout the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, the 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 Israelis have taken advantage of it, and these and the Israelis have 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 basically made a great effort not to be bitten by that victory disease bug themselves. Uh, or not actually. In the case of the Arabs, it wasn't a victory disease. It was just a, you know we're Arabs. So, you know Allah favors us. We can't lose. Uh, doesn't work. All right. So one last game I want to cover before we wrap it up. <clears throat> and Avalon Hill had Africa Corps, but they went ahead and picked up what I think S and T called uh, Desert War, and it yeah. was subtitled uh, uh, Panzer Army Africa. And uh, they picked that up. Um, were you involved with it when they picked that one up or, I or not? I don't think so. That was after I left. Okay. But so I, they pick- I, remember, I remember when we did that game, it was a much more uh, wide open and quicker game than Africa Corps. It was more accurate as well. Uh, yeah, everybody was blown up. I've gone back and read some of the comments on it and uh, – because some of the old timers have gone up on board game geek and they've put their own uh, thoughts about the game when it first came out and like that. Mm -hmm. And they said that they were blown away by the um, movement factors. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. If you had a clear shot, you could go a long way, but you had to have the the logistics. You had to have the fuel. So you had to plan those, those surges, you know, very carefully. Because that's basically, you know, we decided, we realized that was really the key factor in the war in North Africa, the logistics. You could basically you know, stockpile uh, ammo and food and, what, and ammunition, what have you, and you could go roaring off. And assuming you could get the enemy couldn't really put up a good uh, resistance, uh, you could roll all the way to Cairo. Uh, Cairo. Uh, Montgomery understood that uh, better than any of the previous uh, British generals. And of course, the Americans, when they came in from the uh, from the West, we also understood understood it. In fact, the Germans, some German officers, you know, taken prisoner uh, later in the war, complain: "You Americans don't fight fair. You use all this firepower and you have all this <laughs> artillery. And why don't you fight like soldiers?" And why? You know, as, as Patton pointed out in his his, uh, his speeches, he says, "Your job is not to die for your country; it's to make the other guy die for his country. Yeah. And if you do that to enough of them, they'll they've lost." Uh, so, I mean, well, you know, he was inspiring, whereas the Germans were throwing their hands up and saying, what the hell can you do? But although you must keep in mind, uh, this is Trevor Dupee did the research on this when the documents became available. On the tactical level, the Germans would, would normally win, all things being yeah. equal, but all things weren't equal. You know, if we had a big advantage in our tournament, in fact, by, the, by late 1944, uh, American tank units with, uh, with Shermans we're defeating uh, German uh, tank units with Panthers and and and, and late model Mark IVs uh, because we simply had better trained crews, more experienced crews, and they didn't just go out there and get blown up. They would use uh, hard hard earned tactics. Uh, they knew how the Germans operated, and once they found out they were uh, facing rookies, they just chewed them up. And there it's was not weapon system on weapon system. It's whole oh, entire system against. Yes. Yes. And, the, and the Israelis pointed it out. They, they, you know, I think after the Six Day Wars, well, did you have, you know, uh, uh, superior weapons? I said, no, we could have switched weapons with the Arabs and we still would have beat them. And that, yeah. some people thought that was Ravada, but it was actually quite accurate because the, <laughs> the Germans, the Israelis, had, <laughs> they didn't like, like to publicize this, but the troops understood it. I remember getting a letter from one Israeli war gamer who was in the army. I think he was in the 67 war. He's in the infantry unit. He says, you know, we were real panzer grenadiers out there. Now, this is something I guess you didn't say in public. And well, maybe yeah. you did in Israel, but you know, it was not official policy. They basically created, you know, uh, Jewish panzer grenadiers. Mm-hmm. And uh, even the Germans admired it. Yeah. So you just mentioned a name that I had meant to, to speak to you about it sometime. Uh, that's a, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Trevor Dupé. Did, is that how you say his last name? Dupé. Dupé. Okay. Uh, you uh, did you know him? Yes, quite well. Do you want to explain what he contributed? And I think people have lost it. I've started collecting his books again. 
Um, he but he contributed war- a lot, right? He was designing war games. So he's, he, he had two thrusts. One was collecting, you know, source information from both sides and running analysis, you know, crunching numbers. I mean, basically, operations research 101. But he was also trying to develop a, a war game. And he did. He had a war game system, again, which was similar to the correlation of forces system the, the, German, the Russians used. Russians. But the, the, the Germans still used, you know, they, you could recognize it was a gaming board, not hexagons, but you were moving pieces around. And they were using, you know, tables of, of attrition and movement and what have you. It was quite accurate. In fact, the story, which is true, uh, when we invaded Normandy, the Germans were conducting one of those map exercises. And uh, they said, well, should we keep it going? I says, yes, just reorient some of the, uh, some of the, some of the pieces, as it yeah. were. Uh, and they used that game as a training tool. And that was the same thing uh, happened in, with Mark Herman, who was a uh, worked for SPI, uh, you know, through the, in the golden years, as it were, and later became a big shot uh, a game design, a game developer, vice president at uh, Booz Allen. Uh, he, um, he basically designed the game and he had just come out before the Gulf War, before Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990 called Gulf Strike, whatever, whatever it was. Yeah. Gulf anyway, Strike. That was yeah. it. And, uh, and he basically, uh, some people in, in the Pentagon knew about it and within 24 hours, record time for the Pentagon, they put him on the contract to take that, use that game, plug in classified information where necessary and basically predict how the war was going to work out. He did it, and it was very accurate. Right. Uh, they, they kept that secret because they had all these bi- millions and millions of dollars worth of computer models, which you know didn't get up to speed until early '91. Uh, but Mark was doing it. Well, he designed the game, but any any competent gamer, you know, could have done the same thing. Uh, and they modified it as needed, played it overnight, and delivered the report the next day. Uh, Austin had an example of that when he was down in Southcom. When they needed a an instant analysis of a brewing war between but, but was a brewing, Arabian Arabian Nightmare, which well, you, that, you that, and that me was published you, 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 was you, in nineteen fall of nineteen ninety, and it was you published it, Jim, in December right. nineteen. 19- 90, yeah. you know, at the before, and it had that scenario in there that I wrote up, Beware the Ides of January. Yeah. <laughs> Missed by two days. So one last name I want to talk about with you guys is Steve Patrick. You guys are both great writers, but he was also a great writer for S&T. What's happened to him? He's, uh, he's, he's still around. He, uh, I last saw him about two years ago at um, uh, what you call it in, in Pennsylvania, Lan- Lancaster, one of the one of the war gaming conventions. Yeah, and he's on Facebook. He's retired now. Okay. Um, he's. You yeah. said he was a lawyer. Is is that he's right? A lawyer. Yeah. 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 Hey, and he was, he and was a right. general. Actually, he was a National Guard general. Oh right, oh. right. He became a brigade brigade commander. Brigade I believe. commander. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in fact, he had me come down and lecture his uh, his intelligence uh, officers uh, once in the uh, 80s. I think when he was when he had his brigade. Uh, yeah, but he was a very he was a he was a war game designer uh, and a good historian. He and Al, you know, basically worked together on a lot of those press tags games. Uh, oh, okay. Region, uh, Renaissance of infantry, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And again, that was something Viking. That was again, that's something. That's why it's so expensive to buy on eBay. The, 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 you know, most of those copies got thrown away. But people who know know them, know the game, know the system, know it's basically uh, you know golden, as it were. Right. Uh, you know, gem. Uh, you know, a gold gem, old gold, as it were. Um, because if you wanted to do a modern, a computerized, you know, uh, romp through history at the tactical level, that's probably the cheapest place to start. Yeah. Way to start. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Steal from the best. Well, we've we're at the end of our time. I uh, just like to tease the next session. We're we're going to go back and talk about something that you guys did at SPI called the Friday Night Follies, uh-huh. uh, <laughs> and uh, that that will be fun. And then I also want to talk about. Your poll, your, I call it a polling system, but reader feedback. Yes. And uh, along with uh, how people played solo games, and then you guys started doing solo games. Yeah. Uh, and so that's what we'll talk about next time. So we'll be talking uh, the game specifically. We'll be talking about is the the fall of Rome, which which you didn't design, but I'm sure you were involved with, and then. Uh, Operation Olympic and Wolfpack, which, by the way, uh, Phil Sabin, who is the 
lecturer in England on <clears throat> oh, I can't think of what he the war studies is what he yeah. lectures on. He calls it the finest solo game ever. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, which is quite a compliment since, uh, you know, you're, you're out there competing against John Butterfield's RAF, which is considered by the best by a lot of people, but, uh, and it may be just because they've never seen Wolfpack and they, they ought to pull it out. So that's what we'll be talking about next time. And, uh, and uh, it was great today. All the the history stuff along with the game stuff, it, it was a great session, guys. So we'll talk to you next time. All right, take weeks. care. Did, Bye. Did you get you got the picture, right? Yeah, I did. And we'll good. get that up. All right. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Have a good Bye. weekend.